I'm going to do a quick intro. So I'm Jess, the conservation coordinator with Nature Nova Scotia. Um, this is our monthly nature talk. Usually it's on the first Tuesday of every month, but today it's on Monday because there's a deadline coming up tomorrow, which we're going to be talking about a little bit. Um, we are joined by Ecology Action Center staff, Will Balsker, the Coastal Adaptation Coordinator at the Ecology Action Center. And we're also joined by Mimi O'Hanley, the Wetlands and Water Coordinator. We're all here to learn more about the Coastal Protection Act, the also known as CPA, its connections to wetland and its impact on coastal communities and property owners. Will and Mimi will be presenting on key topics and at the end they will be willing to answer some questions to help folks understand the proposed regulations. Also discuss current consultation processes and outline how you can contribute your efforts and feedback. Uh, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Will to do his presentation. Perfect. Okay. Um, so, yeah, thanks for coming out, everyone. Um, if you attended our, uh, our recent, I say recent, back in August, a uh, virtual uh, town hall there, uh, the actual uh, meat and potatoes that we're going to be discussing about the Coastal Protection Act is going to be largely the same. Um, and I'll give a preface that we haven't actually gotten any new information on what the proposed regulations are going to look like since um, the summer of 2021. Um, so if, if you do want any more information about it, unfortunately, we're all in the same boat of uh, waiting and crossing our fingers. Um, I'll turn it over to Mimi now just to do our uh, territorial acknowledgement. Great, thanks Will. Uh, hi everyone, so we just want to begin today by acknowledging that we're gathering on unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq people. These lands are governed by the Peace and Friendship Treaties. As we discuss important environmental issues today, we'd like to acknowledge that the Mi'kmaq people are the original stewards and knowledge holders protecting and respecting the environment. Okay, so uh, as a brief agenda rundown, uh, like Jess had said, I'm going to give a quick presentation and then uh, Mimi is also going to give a presentation discussing wetlands and the, sort of the interaction that it has with the Coastal Protection Act, as limited as it may be. Um, and then we'll have time for questions and discussion afterwards if anyone uh, has anything that they'd like to discuss. Uh, moving right into our first presentation, uh, I'll give the best outline I can, and again, uh, all this with the preface that we don't have any new information on what it looks like internally since uh, the proposed documents came out in 2021. Um, so this is the most up-to-date that we have in terms of what it looks like on the inside of Nova Scotia environment. Um, simply put, the Coastal Protection Act, or the CPA, is the first of its kind legislation in Canada. Um, we still use that line, even though PEI and BC are, are quickly at our heels with their own coastal protection regulations. And um, basically what this is going to be doing is defining the coastal zone or coastal protection zone as it's sometimes referred to, uh, which is a zone of control reaching 80 to 100 meters inland from the high water mark. Uh, and I want to highlight that that is not a blanket setback. I've had a couple realtors <laughs> I've seen making announcements about this and other people being uh, uh, sort of uh, confused about whether or not this is a setback or an area of control. I want to be absolutely clear that this is an area of control 80 to 100 meters inland from the high water mark not a blanket setback of 100 meters across the province, um, which which would be a very bad approach given how varied our, our coastal geography is in Nova Scotia. Um, this area of control is going to cover the entire coastline of the province outside of what they're calling developed waterfronts. So you're, you know, your Halifax downtown, your downtown Bedeck, that, that kind of thing, your developed uh, working waterfronts. And it's going to include tidal waters, estuaries, uh, and even bearish wa ponds. So some of those uh, waters that are not strictly ocean, but are tidally influenced, or in the case of bearish wa ponds, uh, bound to be coastally influenced or tidally influenced at some point uh, in their evolution as they become breached, uh, especially with sea level rise and increased erosions. And within that coastal zone, new development only will be subjected to A, a minimum elevation standard above sea level, and B, will require a site-specific assessment performed by a designated professional under the Act to determine a horizontal setback from the high water line. This is actually one of our favorite things about the Act is that it's tailored to the specific geography, erosion, and hydrology of the property, not a blanket approach. And the designated professional's report will then be submitted to the local municipality and evaluated as part of the existing building and development permitting process. 
And so as for existing development, the proposed regulations are suggesting a restriction on increasing the internal volume of the structure, which is the National Building Code's way of saying you can't make it any bigger, especially if only part of it is inside the uh, uh, a setback violation. You can't make that part any bigger. You can't add any expansions or anything like that. Um, and, and that's only, again, if it's too close to the water or too low in elevation. Um, so there's a, a basic rundown of it. Um, this is kind of what it, um, uh, they're proposing in terms of setbacks. Again, we're talking about uh, mild, <laughs> a mild amount of regulation, nothing new on uh, shoreline structures, a minimum elevation above that sea level, and uh, a site-specific horizontal setback from the high water mark. Um, of course, what we see is missing uh, is that there's no further restriction on armor rocking or, or shoreline armoring. Um, it's all currently regulated by the Department of Natural Resources, and the regulation is just going to kind of match up with the existing regulations on that. Nothing new, nothing stricter. So we would obviously like to see something stricter on that um, and, and around infilling as well. Uh, of course, we'd also like to see the promotion of nature-based solutions as opposed to just <clears throat> throwing rocks into the ocean and crossing our fingers, which has been the uh, common approach and, and largely seen as ineffective and, and actually damaging to the beaches and ecosystems around. Um, and of course, setbacks for on-site septic and wells. Uh, those are two critical parts of any uh, rural housing development that have sort of been left to the wayside under the Coastal Protection Act. Um, you're not going to get very far building a house if you don't have uh, a septic field or a well. And those are still allowed to be built in known flood risk areas at the moment. So you'd have the house in a very safe position, but you may be permitting the you know, development of a septic field um, in a known flood risk or, or high erosion area. Uh, which obviously, again, doesn't do you or your neighbors any good. It's pretty hard to enjoy a cottage without uh, a septic system, and a eroding septic system does not uh, do the uh, surrounding ecological community uh, any favors either. And uh, also immediate efficacy of the Act. It should be noted that there is a phase rollout that was discussed internally um, that could take up to five years before there's sort of a hard line on no more uh, development uh, in contravention of the Act. Um, obviously, we would like to see the Act implemented immediately and also no phased rollout, especially up to five years to continue to allow people to get their foot in the door. This is one of my favorite examples of something that <clears throat> would never have been permitted uh, to start and in the first place, if we had a Coastal Protection Act in place, this is uh, Halifax, former Halifax Mayor Peter Kelly's development in Eagles Head Beach uh, as of last summer. And uh, I'll scroll to another picture. You can already see that there's a, a low-lying lagoon above it and a beach right in front. This is standing well below the high water mark on that property, looking up at that same hole for the foundation. Um, so again, it, it, you can see that this is not only extremely low-lying, but also hemmed in between a, a wetland and the uh, very shallow, very sandy beach. So something that purely based on elevation would never have been permitted if the Coastal Protection Act was in place, never mind its proximity to the uh, freshwater course and the beach itself. And so this is why I point to why we need a Coastal Protection Act. Oh, yeah, there's another site picture of it here. If you can see my cursor where I'm wiggling it here, that's where the foundation was dug. Um, you can see that it's a very, very uh, precarious strip of land there. Um, so you say, why do we need a Coastal Protection Act? Uh, as many of you may know, if you're coastal property owners or you're interested in coastlines the way that I am, uh, Nova Scotia, along with the rest of the Maritimes, is set to face the highest relative sea level rise rates in the country, at least a metre by 2100, as the best estimates go now. And we're already seeing erosion rates of more than a foot per year in parts of the province, particularly those low-lying sandy areas and most of the North Shore, uh, very similar geography to PEI in that case. And also increasingly frequent and intense storms and flooding events like we saw last summer. And so where a majority of Nova Scotia's coastlines are largely unregulated uh, by municipal land use bylaws, this sort of holistic province-wide approach to development control is by far the most efficient uh, and expedient method of preventing further reckless construction. Um, the very first step to adapting our uh, to our changing climate and to our changing coasts is to prevent new development from occurring in existing known flood risk and erosion risk areas. That doesn't deal with the harder conversations that we're going to have about the, you know, 70% of Nova Scotians who already live in coastal communities that may or may not be a, a, at imminent risk. Uh, this is just, you know, the 
to to stop uh, the train <laughs> before it gets any worse, so to say. And uh, yeah, this is all a, a picture of the municipalities of Nova Scotia, all to say that cutting it up into 49 different pieces is probably the slowest way and, and least efficient uh, way to do this. And unfortunately, that's something that the premier has recently discussed as an option. Um, all to say that that has always been an option. Uh, municipalities have always been able to make uh, development regulations uh, in coastal areas or otherwise, it's always been a resourcing issue. Even the best resource planning departments in the province uh, have not been capable of producing uh, coastal regulations uh, to this caliber, uh, never mind implementing and, and enforcing them. So I'll move now to a, uh, oh, this is a wonderful picture of PEI, as I was saying, about the, <laughs> the, uh, uh, similarity that we have on the North Shore and the geography of PEI. This is post-Hurricane Fiona, where some sand dunes lost up to 30 feet of depth uh, in a single overnight uh, post-tropical depression event. This was not even a hurricane by the time that it made landfall there. Just very bad luck with lining up with the high tides in that area. And again, we got very good luck with Hurricane Lee recently and with Fiona itself for missing a lot of the uh, other highly populated areas. So for a timeline of the development of the act and regulations, I've chosen some melting clocks to show how long this may have, uh, this may seem to have taken. <laughs> the Coastal Protection Act uh, legislation was passed with all party support in April of 2019 uh, and has since undergone significant consultation processes to develop the regulations. Uh, starting in 2018, multiple rounds of engagement and feedback sessions have consulted the public, municipalities, professional associations and any other identified stakeholders and detailed reports on the proposed regulations were released back in 2021 with engagement results being published in the what we heard report in 2022 so implementation of the regulations was promised in the 2022 climate plan that was released and immediately following hurricane fiona Nova Scotia Environment Climate Change Minister uh, Timothy Hallman pledged to roll out the Coastal Protection Act uh, in what he quoted as early 2023. Uh, unfortunately, that was delayed in March indefinitely. And on August 1st of this year, uh, Minister Hallman announced that the province would not commit to implementing the regulations before July 2025, which happens to be the next election. Uh, and he's citing a desire for more consultation and education for coastal property owners. We recently completed a freedom of information request <clears throat> on Nova Scotia Environment Internal Communications uh, back in April that would seem to indicate that right up until mid-March of this year, there was every intention of rolling out the regulations before the end of that month. Um, there's no smoking gun, of course, pointing to uh, who or, or what might have caused this sudden, uh, I say, a sea change, but there's this uh, unilateral uh, change to an indefinite delay about halfway through March. As far as we're concerned, uh, the regulations were actually completed uh, internally in March and, and have just been uh, just been shelved. So starting October 5th, uh, just about a month ago, the province launched an online uh, survey targeted at coastal property owners, but of course welcomed everyone to fill it out. <clears throat> Their outreach uh, included targeted online ads and a postcard sent to every coastal property owner's address that was listed in the provincial property online database, um, which has been proven to be an issue as many of the addresses are outdated and some owners have never received that postcard or invitation, even on the same street, we've had neighbors uh, either get or not get the postcard. So there's a bit of an issue with rollout there and, and contacting uh, property owners. The, uh, the survey contains a lot of broad and high level questions and language uh, that may have been appropriate in 2019. They ask questions like, what do you think about a Coastal Protection Act? Do you think we should have one? Uh, that may have been appropriate four years ago or even a decade ago when the legislation was started, but it seems you know, sort of wholly regressive and inappropriate for late 2023. Again, as far as we're concerned, they're already completed internally. And not to mention there's a number of misleading questions around the availability of flood insurance for homes and insurance for coastal erosion of property itself, of land, uh, which as we've come to understand is not actually uh, available. So while we do have significant issues with the survey rollout and questions, we do still believe very strongly in public consultation and encourage everyone, if possible, to fill out uh, the survey before it closes at the end of the day tomorrow, uh, November 7th. Um, I've got a link uh, that I'll post in the chat here um, that you can see our response to it, and uh, it'll also have a link to the survey. Um, 
further on the timeline, uh, Group ATN consultants uh, or Consulting Incorporated were hired uh, to carry out the survey. And following the completion, uh, they'll prepare an internal report for the minister detailing the findings. That's scheduled for either December or January of 2024. Um, uh, sorry, December of 2023 or January 2024. Uh, there have been no additional plans or reasons uh, for delay announced regarding the interim year and six months, which would bring us to the next provincial election uh, in, in July 2025. So we're, we're curious to see what comes of that report and, and whether there's any additional actions or consultations or anything planned between now and, and July 2025. So since uh, the delays were announced in March 2023, we've been particularly outspoken in the media regarding our disappointment uh, in the delays, and we've been working very closely with municipal councils and coastal property owners uh, across the province, which we're still continuing uh, to do until the regulations are released. Uh, the coastal and water team is also providing policy recommendations for a number of municipalities who are interested in developing their own coastal development regulations in the meantime, sort of as a stopgap until we do have this provincial measure in place. And we also announced today, actually, in a press release that uh, we've been contacting all the municipal councils to sign on to a joint statement calling on the province to implement the act uh, immediately. And we've been working on that since early summer of this year. To date, six have signed on to our statement and seven have signed their own letters with the uh, same or similar language and intent. Now, if you don't see your municipality up here, one of the best things you could do for our campaign is to reach out to either your mayor, your warden, or your councillors um, and see if they're interested uh, in, in uh, signing on to it. Um, they've all gotten an email, or all the mayors and wardens have gotten an email and multiple phone calls from me at this point. So uh, again, if, if you don't see uh, your, your region up there, uh, please feel free to reach out to your uh, elected representatives on that. And uh, the last thing I'll say is we also have had a very successful and ongoing letter campaign uh, for the public to contact Minister Hallman, Premier Houston, and their local MLA calling for the release of the regulations. And, uh, that does it all for me. Thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll hear from Mimi now. Yeah, awesome. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yeah, perfect. Give me one second. Okay, perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. So the reason why we wanted to talk about wetlands, I know everyone's here to talk about the CPA, but uh, we, we recognize that nature and natural environments and the ecosystems within these natural environments aren't siloed. And there's a lot of connection between wetlands and coastal areas and coastal communities. Uh, so we just wanted to look and reflect on the, the connection between the two and also how different policies and legislation impacts both coastal areas and wetlands. So I would just wanna start with what a wetland is because different folks uh, think of wetlands differently. Uh, there's also a lot of different official definitions of um, for wetlands. So just for tonight's presentation, we're using the definition that wetlands are low lying areas of land where fresh or salt water gathers. Wetlands may be quite small or they can span across large areas. In Nova Scotia, we have swamps, bogs, marshes, fens, vernal pools, and coastal lagoons. Um, in terms of coastal areas and coastal communities, yes, of course, you'll find salt marshes there, um, but freshwater wetlands can also exist in coastal areas as well. So it's important to think about both. Um, benefits of wetlands. So of course, wetlands can benefit both us and nature quite uh, significantly. They're a biodiversity hotspot, which as we know is really important. They sequester huge amounts of carbon, which is great because that helps to mitigate climate change. But if a wetland is destroyed, um, that carbon can be released and then that wetland becomes a climate change contributor. Can also buffer storms. Um, so especially here in Nova Scotia, in coastal areas and coastal communities, wetlands can buffer uh, wind and wave energy during Hurricane Sandy in New York State, it was estimated that areas that had wetlands in their coastal areas um, or, uh, experienced 30% less um, damage in, in those properties and in those areas because of the wetlands, because they were so good at buffering that energy. Wetlands are also natural sponges. Of course, Nova Scotia is no stranger to water and big rainstorms. And as the climate continues to change, we're gonna see different weather patterns, including more rain and more significant rain in a short amount of time, similar to what we saw earlier this summer. Um, so because wetlands can absorb so much water, uh, there really are allies in those um, 
times. Wetlands can also filter water, so um, sediments can fall to the bottom and, and water can come out of wetlands cleaner than when they entered. And of course, wetlands can also offer recreation purposes. So um, harvesting or fishing, canoeing, hiking, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, they're not always the prettiest to look at depending on the, the wetland you're, you're dealing with, but they do offer some recreational opportunities. Uh, wetland destruction and degradation. So it's estimated that 85% of wetlands globally have either been destroyed or degraded by human activity uh, since 70, 1700. So that is quite a bit. Uh, of course, no, Nova Scotia is no stranger to this wetland destruction. Um, which is why at EAC and a lot of environmentalists believe that every remaining wetland that we have matters and uh, is important and we need to we need to be doing a better job at protecting them. The top threats to wetlands include infilling for development, uh, conversion of land, excessive runoff, poor stormwater management, invasive non-native species, household runoff, roads, and climate change. Uh, so when we destroy wetlands, we also lose all the incredible benefits that I was talking about before. Um, and these benefits, of course, are, are great for both us and the planet. So we like to say that protecting wetlands protects us. Wetlands are our allies, but we have to help them help us. So. Uh, wetland protection in Nova Scotia. So there, uh, of course, are ways outside of policy and legislation that you can protect wet wetlands, such as education. Um, but there are also are ways within policy and legislation where wetlands are protected. Uh, so the Environment Act, also um, environmental assessments, but the main way that wetlands are protected or the main, the main body that, that looks at wetlands is the Nova Scotia Wetland Conservation Policy. So this is from 2011, so it's a, over a decade old. Um, I, I do like to celebrate this policy. Like, of course it can be strengthened and there, there are gaps, but I do like to celebrate this policy because it does exist. Um, and not every jurisdiction has, has a wetland policy or, or legislation that, that deals specifically with wetlands. So that, that's already a step up. And I think that's already a win for, for Nova Scotia, but we do need to keep fighting for further wetland protection. Because as I was saying before, at this point, every wetland does matter and is helping us. So the CPA, the Coastal Protection Act and wetlands. So the CPA does not mention wetlands. Uh, wetlands are largely covered by the policy that I was just talking about. So the Nova Scotia Wetland Conservation Policy. The CPA does offer indirect protection through horizontal setbacks and minimum, minimum elevation requirements for the new developments outside of population centers. So most coastal and tidal estuary adjacent wetlands will be protected in coincidence as they're located at or below the high water line, and therefore they're well below buildings of appropriate elevation. Um, another wetland that will be automatically protected um, are salt marshes. They're what the, the wetland policy calls wetlands of special significance. And generally speaking, you can't touch um, you can't touch these salt marshes. So, but that doesn't, yeah, the, the freshwater wetlands you still could develop over, but if if it's in line with what the CPA is covering, then those ones should be safe as well. And that's it from me. So I can turn it over to Will. Alrighty, it's right on to the half an hour mark. Um, we're welcome to take any questions or comments people have. Uh, if you wanna discuss uh, anything about the surveys, obviously I have pages worth of <laughs> things to say about that survey. And I'm seeing a bit of that in the chat as well. Um, I tried to be very polite in my uh, answers, but uh, of course, uh, again, I wanted to point out that some of the questions are rather misleading or, or uh, like has been said, uh, very, very, very broad, very high level, very, I think, inappropriate for, for what we're seeing um, in terms of how far along we are in the regulatory process. So if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand physically uh, and or digitally, and we'll try to get to you in order. Yeah, if you want, Will, I can I can read out any questions we get in the chat. For sure. Um, I see someone has their hand raised. You can you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Hello. I wonder if you can hear me because I usually lock the computer so much. I don't use audio or video mostly. We yep, can we hear can. you fine. Yeah, good. Um, 
So after the survey deadline tomorrow night, whom can we follow up with in the government in order to chase up <laughs> that person and basically um, hold them accountable and not just let, you know, okay, we filled out the survey. Mm. Now we want to know why are you going to take a year and a half uh, to analyze the results, et cetera. So who can we bother once a month <laughs> on a regular basis until they actually do it? Well, I'll give you the two names that I bother the most. Uh, it was Jason Hollett, uh, but he's unfortunately moved to a different part of the province now. He was the assistant deputy minister. So now uh, I, I still uh, uh, bother Gordon Smith quite a lot. He's the project lead um, on the Coastal Protection Act now as, as of March of this year. And of course, Minister Holman. I, I CC him on, a, on just about every email that I can. Um, there is a designated email set up for this consultation process, but I, I would I would defer directly to contacting uh, either the minister and or Gordon Smith himself. Could you put their names uh, in the chat? For sure. So we can have it and look them. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, what were those two names? Will I assume you'll put them in the chat? That was uh, Gordon Smith. Gordon uh, Smith. Gordon Smith. And who else? And uh, Minister uh, Timothy Holman. He's the current Minister of Nova Scotia Environment. It's Gordon Smith. And, oh, perfect. Uh, I, I don't like that you said you bother them. I don't think you're bothering them. I think you're advocating for the post. <laughs> I certainly hope I'm not bothering them, but I know that uh, we we have uh, different opinions on on you know uh, when this act should be put out, and I, and I know that uh, uh, I, I can be rather biting in the media uh, about it, or or at least I've become more more particular in my demands, uh, especially when it comes to uh, media interviews there, and that's the minister's uh, email also in the chat. Thank you for that, uh, Virginia. Did you have a question? Well, I I was asked by. Um, uh, Jess, why I thought the survey was degrading. And <clears throat> the reason I thought so is because the questions were leading. Uh, they assumed that we wanted to build or that we were questioning why we couldn't build. And I, my husband and I have always taken the position that we would not even consider it. And... <clears throat> Further to that, that if there was anything we could do in the nature of, well, let's say Rosemary Lonis, um, protecting the coastal water for, of, with uh, different plants and what <clears throat> trees and whatever, that we would do so. So I took issue with the assumption that anybody that was going to be answering uh, the survey was intending to um, minimize the impact of the Coastal Restoration uh, Protection Act. That was my problem with the survey. No, I absolutely agree. To, I think quite a lot of the questions are very leading and, and sort of, um, in some cases, pointing the responsibility back onto either municipalities or the developer or insurance companies. Um, again, it, it feels uh, very much like an abdication of responsibility that was previously not only accepted, but accepted by all parties and promised on multiple occasions in multiple different uh, situations. So uh, again, yeah, very, very, very frustrating, completely, completely to see where you're coming from. Um, what was the consultation company? that you uh, mentioned? They have Is a name, uh, Group ATN, uh, ATN Consulting Incorporated. And the only other information we have on them is from uh, a CBC article, uh, which is stating that the cost of the, I'll get the number, the cost of the um, consultation is not to exceed 99,000, what was it? $99,768. Yeah, that's quite a lot of money. And and I, yeah, to, to speak more on the economic angle there, I mean, the, there's three full-time staff members dedicated uh, to the Coastal Protection Act. 
uh, at Nova Scotia Environment and two new hires as of August that are partially working on the file. So it's uh, three and two halves uh, st provincial staff members plus a consultant group. Um, you know, th this is and it's already been going for for almost four years at this point. So you think of how many hundreds of thousands of dollars have gone towards what is essentially a, a shelved act uh, at the moment from the perspective of the province, not to mention the hundreds of millions of dollars that's going to be invested in coastal properties that are currently being allowed to develop in known risk areas and the hundreds of millions of dollars that it's going to cost when it comes time for, uh, you know, disaster relief and recovery from storms that we know are coming and we know are going to be more intense. Um, what's what's like the general consensus from land landowners? Like you said, the survey had a lot of leading questions. So does that mean that most like coastal land or owners are opposed to this or are most of them pro or do we just not know? I, I think at this point we, you know, I, I have uh, I have a skewed perspective. I think most of the coastal property owners who reach out to EAC or are members of EAC are very aware of the act and are in a similar boat to what you're saying, Virginia, are, are interested in doing as little harm as possible if they are going to develop or just not developing a, at all. Um, I, I think the major opposition comes from large development groups who own swaths of our coastline uh, and want to you know, get the most bang for their buck, get the most properties subdivided and built uh, as they possibly can, whether that means infilling uh, wetlands and <laughs> or building right as, uh, up to the shoreline and, and, and putting in large concrete blocks like it, it just I, I, I suspect that that's where a majority of the opposition is coming from. And of course, there's no emails to prove that. I, I think most of that has gone on over the phone or in person in, in, in regards to lobbying efforts. But that the minister, uh, sorry, not the minister, the premier himself said he has not been lobbied on this on this topic. Another quick one. You can do the math. How many? Yeah, I can. I can crunch some numbers for them if they're having trouble for eighteen months. Um, how many people do you think? Okay, if every person that has a property already on the coastline answered this survey, how many people are we talking about here? I think it would be tough because they'd have to define what they meant by their parameters of okay. coastal. Obviously, the Coastal Protection Act is <laughs> designated for tidally influenced waters or even soon to be tidally influenced waters like Barishwa ponds. Depending on how they drew their line of what's coastal and what's not, we could be pushing all the way up into Truro uh, with with what you define as a coastal property owner because that's tidally influenced estuary, mm -hmm. uh, a very tidally influenced estuary at that. Um, so I, I, I really wouldn't stoop to get, I know that 70% or more of Nova Scotians live in coastal communities. Um, and again, the survey is technically for everyone, but obviously targeted at coastal property owners. Um, and it's an interesting bit of math there. I, ha I haven't broken it down quite like that, but that's a uh, that's a very good that's a very good parameter. I, I'm not sure if the consultants are going to be on for the next year and six months or whether they're just being hired to run this consultation survey process and spit out a report at some point in, in December or, or January. Okay. I'm just trying to figure out how many surveys <clears throat> do they actually expect to get back? Mm -hmm. I'd be very interested to see the results of the report. It's 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 yeah. been made very clear to me that it's not going to be a what we heard report, a very public facing consultation report. Um, so I, I suspect that it is going to be internal for governance purposes. But I would really like to see a copy of it personally. Okay, sorry, don't want to monopolize, but one more question: Does the Access to Information Act would that give you? any access to the raw data, even if it's sanitized, no names, no address, no, you know, to identify even the community, just, you know, give us the raw numbers so we can analyze mm. them ourselves. Would, would the I, act allow that? I suspect it would. The most recent Freedom of Information Act request was done by a team at CBC back on uh, September 7th. Uh, and that was a really big one that pulled all um, consultation materials or all submitted feedback for the breadth of the regulatory development process. So all the way back in, in 2019 to, I think they went to uh, June 16th of 2023. So that was um, 
uh, hundreds of responses. I think 178 responses were produced in total. So uh, hopefully uh, the, those would be uh, uh, included in a future FOIPOP um, or whatever results come of the survey. Okay, let's do it. Let's get our hands on the raw data. On. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> do the number crunching ourselves. That, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> We have a couple of volunteers. Um, well, do you have, do you, is there like a petition or anything or like a letter already written? Yeah, we, we do have a letter. We do have a letter to target campaign that's uh, dedicated towards Minister Holm and the premier. And if you put in your postal code, you'll also CC your local MLA. Um, that's been ongoing since uh, April uh, of this year. I can post that in the chat there as well once I track it down uh, off of our website. Um, yeah, that sounds great. But that, that one's been very, very successful, and we've been very happy with the results uh, uh, of that. And, and we think, it again, it, our messaging hasn't changed on this. We've just gotten sort of more frustrated as we go forward and as, as the act is continually delayed. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question here from Ian Guppy. Has there been any effort to woo the insurance industry to be an ally in pressuring the government into action? They would stand to benefit and claim reductions near and long term with better regulations. Uh, we we've uh, attempted to make contact with a, a, and have made contact with a number of uh, different insurance corporations around the Maritimes. Uh, recently, EAC joined Climate Proof Canada, which is a national organization of largely uh, insurers, uh, and it's it's run by the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Uh, so we're hoping to make some inroads there uh, to make some better connections. But uh, from our initial conversations with uh, uh, folks at IBC, uh, that's how we came to discover this whole issue of insuring coastal property against erosion in the first place and sort of got to understand why some of those questions around insurance of flood or, or, or uh, coastal erosion are, are misleading in the first place uh, in the survey. Um, and, and just pointing out uh, how rare flood insurance is in Nova Scotia. A majority of these properties are, are not eligible for insurance unless you have very, very deep pockets and a, and a very generous uh, insurance provider. Yes. I'll, Mimi, I'll ask you a question. Um, would you like to see the coastal protection area cover wetlands? That's such a great question. I've never actually been asked it before. Um, I don't know that the CPA necessarily needs to cover wetlands specifically, um, but I think maybe maybe to talk a little bit about it, either like in the preamble or wherever it may be, just to acknowledge that wetland ecosystems and coastal ecosystems are so intertwined. Um, yeah, but I, I do think there needs to be better protections of wetlands overall. And, and because we know how beneficial wetlands in coastal areas are. Um, yeah, I, I think, well, both, I don't wanna say that it needs to be specifically coastal wetlands because both inland and coastal wetlands are really important, but yeah, there, there definitely needs to be more protections of wetlands overall. Yeah, I think that goes for um, most of like our natural areas in Nova Scotia, there needs to be better protection in general. Um, just checking. Any other final questions for our uh, guest speakers? Now this was a, a bit of a quicker nature talk, but it's still very thorough. And um, I'm going to be signing the letter. Um, I also need to fill out the survey after this. But yeah, very- Surveys. Survey is quite quick if you're not a coastal property owner or a prospective coastal property owner, I will add. Um, but yeah, feel free to have a look through our, our response on that uh, as well to see the, the breadth of all the questions that they ask. Okay. Yeah. Do you do you want to give us a quick summary of that or? Uh, a quick summary of all the different questions or, or of our response? Of your response. Uh, yeah, I think we've, I think we've used most of the, <laughs> we've used most of the words already, uh, okay. in, in our, in our discussions about it, but the, the key words be, um, yeah, broad, high level, uh, misleading, misinformed, um, and, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it just feels like spinning of wheels. Um, I, I told the minister, uh, uh, or sorry, no, I told, uh, Gordon, um, and the, uh, assistant deputy minister, Jason Holland, uh, Jason Hollis, uh directly that 
you don't have to go to planning or, or, or you know, public feedback uh, school for a master's to understand that genuine consultation comes from approaching people with details mm. of your regulations, not asking these, again, very broad, what do you think about coastal protection in Nova Scotia? Again, maybe four to 10 years ago, but now that something is tangibly finished internally, come back to us with details about what it's going to look like, um, how you're going to deal with these tidally influenced waters, what's a coast, what's not, um, you know, what's the mapping going to look like? Can everybody look at it? Is it just a designated professionals? Again, it's, it's this black box kind of approach that they've taken um, and, and the consultation doesn't feel genuine uh, through that. It, it, it feels like lip service. Um, it doesn't feel like it's actually going to produce anything of much value. That was really well said. Thank you. Um, any any last uh, last words from you, Mimi? Any last? No, I final think points? we'll we'll pretty much covered it. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. We just keep got to keep fighting this fight. It's been uh, it's been a long haul, but um, we got to do this for the protection of nature, but also the protection for our own communities. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both so much for coming and speaking tonight. I really appreciate it and I appreciate your time. Uh, thanks to everybody who came and it was a wonderful presentation. Bye everybody. Thanks so much, Jess. Thanks everyone. Thank you very Bye. Much. Bye.